Well, as we're warming up for um, Caval to enter the studio, I just want to tell you a little bit about um, his background and, and what he's doing. And as if by magic, Caval, there you are. How are you, my friend? I'm good. Everything just worked out, but I'm so sorry. Three minutes in. No, your 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 timing, my friend, is absolutely perfect. I've just been uh, talking a little bit about the Vegan Organic Network, but now I would like to talk a little bit about you because you are a dental surgeon by day and a sustainability educator by night, which is fantastic. And have you been at the surgery today, Kamal? Yes, uh, it's been a very busy day, but I'm safe and I'm home, so I'm happy. It's all yes. good. That is, I mean, wonderful words, wonderful words. And I can sense you've got a, a beautiful energy, uh, a spiritual energy about you, Caval. I'm just going to do a little introduction about what you're going to get into. And, and then we're going to get into it, which is really fantastic. So everyone, welcome to the show today and to um, Dr. Caval Shah's talk, which is going to be very, very important for us. Now, Caval's life purpose is to encourage everyone to address and collectively solve environmental emergencies that are significantly threatening the existence of life on earth including our own and his approach is threefold this is what we're going to get in today i'm thoroughly looking forward to it which is physical action societal action and monetary action well very warm welcome to the vegan organic networks talk now caval we've just mentioned to people if they've got any questions for you do send them in on the social media platforms and uh, all our events at veganorganic.net. We're going to have the questions at the end of the talk. So I'd like to hand uh, the show over to Dr. Kaval Shah. And good luck, Shah. Good luck, Kaval. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Giles. Now, um, I just wanted a little bit of assistance with the presentation. Should I just click on present and will that come up then? So uh, Maestro is there in the background and let's hope, let's hope it will. He, he, he's really the, the boss for all of that. So Maestro, if you're there, if Carol clicks on the presentation, he's joining us now. I've, um, normally I control the presentation from here. I didn't realize you had a presentation. Um, oh, okay. Is there any way we can I don't, I don't know whether you can actually control it from where you are. It says share screen. But okay, go go for it. Go for it. See what happens. Okay. This is live TV. It's live TV, everyone. <laughs> this is as good as it gets. <laughs> okay, so let's see now. Entire screen window. Oh, here we go. So let's see. Does that does that work? Well, we we're there. Yeah. So Love can you it. see? Yeah. All right, so let me start the presentation, yeah? Wonderful, yeah. If you go full screen there, we'll be... Start from the beginning. Come on, that's it. Good. All right, so um, again, thank you, everyone, for being here and sharing your time. Um, I feel that when it comes to things like this, even more than the job that I do, even the more important than, than everything else that we do, this, I feel, you know, working and learning and trying to share ideas about how we can make this earth a better place is just so, so important. And um, I'm really, really grateful that we're all here today. So I'll get started as quick as I can. Now, a lot of the things that we go through is things that many of us will already know, right? But there's things that I've learned along the way that I wanted to share with you and get into more things where we might be able to learn something and be more effective in what we're trying to do. So I'll get started. Now, this is one of my favorite quotes. It's by Dr. Maya Angelou. And she says, do the best you can until you know better. And then when you know better, do better. And I feel this is so poignant when it comes to the environmental movement, because I feel that, yes, we do know as a society, we do know what's happening, but we don't know enough and because of that, we're kind of stunted in our progress. So this is a picture of myself and my mum. I uh, just wanted to give you a little bit of background about myself. I was actually born in England, but I spent my first 15 years in Kenya because my grandparents were there. 
and my uh, dad wanted to look after them. So I did my schooling there. Uh, but at that time, I was exposed to two things that really shaped what I wanted to do in the future. And firstly, it was the environment. At that time, there was a lot of poaching going on. The headlines over and over again were about elephants being poached, being hunted. And there was a massive uh, campaign to end the ivory trade. And secondly, poverty. So everywhere we looked, we saw lots of poor people, lots of orphans, you know, rummaging through um, rubbish, trying to get enough food. So those two things really stuck with me. And the other thing was the disparity. The, the difference between the rich and the poor was so wide. And you just it made you wonder, why are we living in a world like this where there's such a disparity and no one seemed to want to help all those who were suffering? So this is kind of what we encountered at that time in the um, 80s and 90s. And it kind of shaped what we wanted to do, it, my friends and myself. So we, you know, we made a little group and we tried to do everything we could. Um, the other things that I tried doing was to use the other skills that I had about painting, drawing, and I kind of geared that towards painting portraits of endangered species in the hope that if I did enough, I could find a way to sell them and use that money to help the environment. So those are just some of the paintings that I did. And then obviously McDonald's infiltrated everywhere and we found out about what it was doing. But at that time, you know, Growing up, vegetarianism was the thing in, as a family, as a religion. But then we didn't know about the egg industry and the dairy industry. So that was a revelation. I'm not going to go into that because we all know about it. So the other thing that kind of transpired from this um, realization uh, when I moved to England was the fact that I wanted to help them. And my dad and I thought about, you know, who we could help in terms of animals. And we found out that out of all the species on the planet, it is the chicken. Chickens were the most abused and the least respected. So we thought, okay, you know what? Let's rescue them. Let's look after them. And let's, you know, use that um, experience to educate others about who they are, not what they are. So we've been very lucky over the years. We've had uh, the, the privilege and the, the ability to rescue about seven to eight chickens and our oldest one now is about 12 to 13 years old, so she's doing really well. And that's Ruby there. And the other thing that we kind of got involved with was doing dental camps in other countries. So obviously in places like Africa, India, healthcare is, and it is just something that the rich afford and the rich can get to. There's a lot of poor people that suffer as a result of dental needs. And I strongly believe and feel that if our basic needs of hunger and health care are not fulfilled, there is no way that we can work together to save the environment. And it all it works, you know, vice versa, whereby if the environment is suffering, we suffer. And if we're, if we're suffering, the environment suffers as well. So then I got involved with the Better Lives Foundation, which is a charity that is aiming to improve the healthcare in Sierra Leone, one of the most uh, deprived countries in the world. So we went there last November, and this is my wife and I, and we managed to treat about 300 to 400 patients um, over a period of about eight to nine days. And it was very, very intense. But as I say to everyone, it was a holiday for the soul. So you know, I'm glad we could be there, but we're planning to go there again because there's a lot of needs still that needs to be addressed. The other thing that I am involved with is uh, um, I began a podcast. This was about six to seven months ago. And what I'm trying to do is expose hidden injustices in society. So basically educate everyone I know and beyond about what is happening, but not coming at it from the obvious animals vegan angle but coming at it from different angles that people can relate with so the first episode was about testing on animals we had dr andre Menashe, who is a world-renowned zoologist and veterinarian who has dedicated his life to ending testing on animals 
We've had um, uh, one of the individuals from Animal Rising. Uh, we've had ladies from Mad Ideas about you know marketing driven by ethics. Now, the underlying theme here is that all of these people who are activists in different ways are all vegan. They're all plant-based, they're all vegan. And their aim is the same thing. We all wanna heal the earth, but what I'm trying to do is come at it in such a way that we can all contribute to it in different ways. And the latest one that I've had the pleasure of interviewing was Dr. Silesh Rao. And for those of you who don't know, I'm gonna just introduce a little bit about him. And he's really shaped my campaign and my life and my activism. Um, and he has basically simplified the message of the climate emergency and how we can solve it. So I want this to be simple, truthful, empowering, and practical. And no one gets left behind. So a little bit about the man who has inspired me greatly. His name is Dr. Silesh Rao. He's one of the original engineers of the internet, which basically means he took the internet from its original analog uh, form to the robust digital superhighway that we are enjoying today. So the fact that this laptop can connect to the internet, the fact that we have all our phones connecting to the internet, all of these devices employ the protocol that he designed that made the internet what it is today. But at the height of his success, he found out about what the climate was going through and what the world was going through. And he, and he went to his wife and he said, look, if this is the state of the world, if this is where we're heading, what is the point of doing what I'm doing and leaving this money for our children when there's not gonna be a world to live in? So since then, he's dedicated his life, 2006, He's dedicated his life to healing the planet. And he's made a promise to his granddaughter, which you see in the picture, uh, to basically heal the world for her. So in his experience and in his, you know, in his work, he's been able to write four amazing books. Uh, and he's also been the executive producer of several documentaries, which you might have already heard of, Cowspiracy, What the Health, Prayer for Compassion, and Medicine, etc. So one of the things that I wanted to touch on for all of us is how can we relate the crisis to the people that we talk to? Because I speak to this, speak about this with my patients, with people that I meet, and the level of awareness about what is happening and why it's happening is so, so minimal. Everyone still thinks about fossil fuels, fueling climate change, everyone's still obsessed about plastic and that's and recycling. Those are the three things that I hear over and over again. So even now in 2024, when we have access to so much, we're still lagging behind in, in understanding. The other thing is connecting. So once we understand the picture, once we understand what's going on, how can we care about it enough to take effective action? So what we have to do is try and relate it back to what we treasure the most, our family, our children, our future. And unless we can make that connection for them, there's not gonna be enough, enough effective action. There'll just be something that is left to the future when it's gonna to be too late. So these are some of the things that we should be thinking about when we speak to other people is what is it that concerns you most about how, about how that would affect you or your family. So when it comes to the environment, ask them, what is it that's concerning? It might be nothing, it might be just a minimal thing, and then ask them, why do you think that this is happening? Let's try and make sure that they come to the conclusion or they come to the understanding themselves, which, which in a way will empower them even more. Now, again, nine times out of 10, most people don't know, and I believe it's because of four reasons. Firstly, lack of awareness. Secondly, apathy. And a lot of the elderly patients that I treat just say, look, this is not my problem. It's my children's problem, and I don't really care because I want to be alive. Disempowerment, for those that care, believe that their actions won't make a difference. This is another thing that we need to address and lack of support. For those of us who do know what's happening, there seems to be a case where there's not enough support to make that happen. Hi, Charles. Wait, wait a sec. Oh, oh Kival, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah hi. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah and, and unfortunately, your slides don't seem to be showing. Oh really? Yeah. Okay. Um, um, I'm not sure that we, we we've got the first slide up there, but the the other ones aren't clicking on. Seem to be moving. Okay. I just let you know. 
Sorry, sorry. sorry. Um, let me just stop sharing and see how we can make this work. Mm. I'm so glad he told me. Show presenter view. Is that is that making a difference in any way? Well, they've disappeared altogether now. Okay, because I've I've stopped sharing. So let me just get out of this again and present. And if I go to slides. Uh, nope, that's not going to work unless I upload the whole file. Should I try doing that? You can Let's try see. it. Um, upload file. Open. Oh, size. Okay, share screen. Hmm. Entire screen. Now, if I try doing so, is that has that made a difference? Oh, it... what about now? Is that can you see you anything just... different? Let's think about those you love. Go and click on another one. Oh yeah, so is that working now? Yeah, that seems to be working. Okay, fine. So if I go back to full screen, uh, let's see. Now, if I move on, can you see this? Yeah, you can see that, yeah. So that's the baby me, can you see me? You can see growing up. Yeah, okay, fine, so I'll just forward that. So sorry about this. And these are what I was working on before. Okay. And sorry, these are these are the chickens that we managed to rescue. That's Ruby. They're all going okay so far. Yep, we can see them all. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Fine. This is our work in Sierra Leone, and this is the podcast that you can access on YouTube or my website, which I'll show you in the end. Uh, but I just wanted to highlight Dr. Salesh Rao's work um, has been fantastic in guiding what I had to share. This is Dr. Salesh Rao and what he's been involved with. And we just came back to how we can relate it to the people that we talk to. Mm, okay, so that's it. So this is kind of the outline of what we will cover. So one of the things that I try and make people understand is the fact that we are completely and entirely dependent on, on the planet itself. So our relationship to planet Earth and the way to look at it is, the, is to see ourselves as just the fetus. We are just the fetus in the womb of Mother Earth. And if our mother is not doing well, if she's ill, if she's sick, then we're going to suffer as well. And I feel that you know, many of us don't realize the connection and we feel that we are the doers rather than the ones that are being done by the planet. So it's very important that we highlight to the people that we talk to how rainforests and oceans are keeping us alive, the rivers and lakes are providing us with the water, the climate regulation, the soil. So if you relate it to how that works in the body, so if you think about the lungs, the arteries, the temperature, the nutrition that we get, the hormones that work, the kidneys, and our children and the other children that our mother earth has which is the wildlife all of these has implications for our health and if we think about our own organs it doesn't take two or three organs to fail before we die it just has to take one organ to die for the entire system to collapse and that is what we're facing right now even though we have multiple planetary systems life support systems it only takes one for everything to fall apart so I'm sure, again, we know about the effects of all of these for us, but I wanted to highlight the, the um, 
the wildlife aspect as well. So this is something that I learned recently, especially when it comes to whales and plankton. So we know that if all the earthworms and all the bees in the world are killed off, all life on Earth would stop existing because they're the ones that are there pollinating, recycling, renewing. So they're absolutely vital. And this is why, you know, the Vegan Organic Network and everything, any other organizations that work in a similar way are so, so important for the vitality and renewal and the sustainability of Earth. But even when it comes to every other species, for example, elephants, now when, you know, when we've um, witness them before, you know, you see them crashing to the un, uh, through the through jungle and 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 people say that, oh, they're, they're breaking the branches away and they're breaking the trees and, the, and they're pushing them down. If we really observe them, what they're doing is fulfilling their role perfectly. They are allowing light to fall onto the ground so that more plants and more vegetation can regenerate. They're doing their bit in such a perfect way, just like every other species are doing their bit in a perfect way. But what really, really amazed me and astounded me was the relationship between whales and phytoplankton. Now, if we think about what they do and where they, the relationship is, basically they keep each other alive. Whales and other, other animals feed on plankton, zooplankton, phytoplankton that live in the ocean. And these are tiny microorganisms that are photosynthetic that exist in trillions you know they are literally the, the the base in this food trophic level that's pretty much even the basis for the whole of life on earth but what's happening is as we're killing off whales and dolphins and fishes we're killing off the phytoplankton as well and what sustains phytoplankton is two things as most of us already might know it's the temperature of the ocean which is going up but also the nutrients that the whales and fishes and dolphins um, recycle from the depths of the ocean, bring them to the top. And also the, the waste from whales and dolphins, you know, are, that's rich in iron and phosphorus, which sustain and literally help proliferate the, the population of phytoplankton. Now, phytoplankton have decreased by 60 to 70% since 1950. And if if they're not existing, we are really, really in trouble because they're the ones that are providing 50 to 85% of the oxygen that we're breathing in right now. And they're sequestering between 40 to 50, perhaps even more percentage of carbon from the atmosphere. So they are vital for our survival. You know, they don't get talked about enough. You know, we talk about reforestation, rewilding, but the ocean is absolutely critical in our survival. And if we do everything, and forget about the ocean and the fishes and the whales and the phytoplankton, we might as well just sign our death sentence because that's how important they are. So relationships, you know, this is again, something that I tell my patients and people that I meet, the real guardians of our planet are not humans. It's these guys, the other, every other species on the planet playing their role perfectly. They're the ones keeping us alive. So it is vital that we keep them alive. So how can we relate it again to ourselves? So when I speak about this again, I try and relate it to health. So for example, lung cancer, right? So if you think about the symptoms of lung cancer, you know, there's difficulty breathing. If it spreads, you know, it ends up debilitating us. The diagnosis is reached by taking x-rays, but again, we have to make sure that the diagnosis is absolutely correct for us to do the thing that comes next, which is address the cause of lung cancer, which is smoking. And if we mistake the diagnosis as asthma, you know, everything else doesn't work. And then once we know the causes of it, we can go to the solutions. In the same way, we have to make people aware that these are the symptoms, these are this is the diagnosis, these are the causes, and these are the solutions. So we know what's happening in the world today. You know, we have wildfires everywhere. We have the death of the oceans. We have a refugee crisis because of flooding, um, because of subsidence, and we have desertification, freshwater, problems but also going back again to the forest so the fact that the forests are dying now 10,000 years ago 12,000 years ago there's about six trillion trees on the planet we've reduced them by half so we're only existing on three trillion th trees and again phytoplankton we know we've lost more than half so I tell my patients again we're 
We're literally surviving on one lung right now. We don't even have two lungs to breathe. We have one lung, right? Now, the other thing that a lot of us assume is that it is burning because of climate change, which is true, but that's a secondary consequence. The biggest cause of the burning of forests is direct conscious burning by the meat and dairy industries. There are fires burning in the Amazon every single day. If you had a satellite picture of it, would be shocked by the number of fires they're burning. Now, again, it's not just about the forests. It's about the soil. It's about the land that sustain the forests. So we know that the soil stores about three times as much of the vegetation above it, but also the fact that if you pull trees out of the ground, we're going to lose carbon as well, and that's all going to um, accumulate in the atmosphere. The other thing is the effect of burning of these forests, again, degrades the soil, and then the effect of ruminants, cows coming in, overgrazing, we lose that soil, and then again, that cannot sustain more vegetation. And if there's no vegetation, no trees, there's no rainfall, because these forests literally produce their own rainfall. Um, and that leads to desert desertification and habitat loss. So all of it is connected. You know, you we change one thing, and there's a there's a you know triad. There's an effect on every single level about destruction. And again, there's no more sequestration of carbon dioxide. The other thing is the imminent melting of the third pole, which is the Himalayan ice fields. Now this irrigates half of the world's population in India and China and most of Asia. And if these melt and they will all be melting, we're going to see wide scale flooding and all of the work that we're doing. And again, I talk to charities about this, that, you know, all of these places that we have work going on, we have charities going on, all of that will be washed away when all of these cities go under. But for those of us who don't care about that, you know, we would like traveling, we like these cities. Again, this is relevant to us because if they go under, then what's there to enjoy for them? Uh, and the real worrying point is the, the tundra. And this is the Siberian permafrost, which has billions, if not trillions of ton of methane underneath it. It's already starting to melt. There was an article in CNN about two years ago, and you can literally see the bubbling of it. And when this starts to release its billions or trillions of tons of methane, the game is truly over. So we're really running out of time. These are the other effects. Some of them are not re even related to climate change, but they don't get talked about. Species extinction, pandemics, world hunger. So the effects, so we're talking about the symptoms now. Now this is how it's gonna affect all of us. So firstly, it's the refugee crisis that is happening already where people are losing their homes. Um, disease like malaria, dengue, cholera, malnutrition. Again, this is getting more and more um, of a serious problem. Um, you know, even traveling to other you know, countries like the Maldives, they're all going under. We recently had, had the, the privilege of traveling to it two years ago. And instead of having sunshine, it was completely um, underwater because there was a massive storm and we were left helping the, the inhabitants to clear the island. We were, we were helping them, trying to find accommodation for them. So that's what's happening. It's not an outside problem anymore. It's not something in the future. It's already happening more riots, more coups, more civil wars. It's all gonna be happening. It's already happening right now. And the other things that people don't realize is that the oceans will continue to warm for many years from now, even if we stopped all fossil fuel use today. So how can we relate it back to the UK? Because people again think it's an outside problem. So these, these are the things that we are um, experiencing, widespread flooding more and more every year. This is gonna take up the insurance premiums for all of us. Um, we won't be able to sell the houses that get um, affected by flooding. Food production, as we already know, it's been an incredibly wet year so far, and that affects us. You know, that affects us in every single level. Food becomes unaffordable, it becomes expensive. We have to import it from other countries. We know about the refugee crisis and how that could affect the entire economy. And of course, pandemics. We know that every single pandemic, if not most of them, have originated from animal. Okay, so relating it back to life support systems. So what's happening at the moment is the breakdown. 
So this is a chart of the, the tipping points or planetary boundaries that, that we are aware of. Um, a few years ago, only four or five were affected. Today, there's already six that we have transgressed. And you can see all the ones in the red are what's been affected. Now, again, these are all interconnected. If one collapses, the others soon follow. But if we stay within the green zone, we can literally survive. Life on Earth can survive forever. So we have to try and go back to it. Um, we can relate that back to the body itself and how we rely on these systems to keep us alive. So if we go back now, if we look at each one, now the least affected one is freshwater. Now, two years ago, the World Economic Forum deemed the freshwater crisis as the number one threat to humanity. Today, it's actually changed to disinformation and misinformation. So this is hindering our own progress and survival because there's so much disinformation going on right now that's confusing people, affecting policies, affecting where money's going. So that's a real problem. But below that, freshwater crisis. So out of all the tipping points and planetary boundaries, it is freshwater which is um, getting affected. When we shift to a vegan world, when we bring the forest back, they are the ones that can restore the water cycle. But also, as we already know, animal agriculture impacts and uses most of the freshwater that we have available to the point where 4 billion people are suffering as a result of not having enough water or water-related problems and diseases. And we're using most of it for production, producing meat, dairy, and eggs. Secondly, we have land system change. We already talked about the fact that we've uh, lost half of the forests in the world. Currently, we're dedicating, as we already know, 45% of all the ice-free land on the planet to animal agriculture for meat, dairy, eggs, fishes, from their food. If we can restore it back, give it back to nature, give 45 to 40% back to nature, we can restore those forests again and get the ecosystems back again. Going back to climate change, now this is the third most uh, affected one. It's not even the top one. We know all about that, so I'm not going to go into that. Biogeochemical flows has to do with nitrogen phosphorus, where we've taken nitrogen from the air, converted it to fertilizer, and now that's ending up in our soil, our land, affecting our waterways, our oceans, creating dead zones. And then novel entities, which is to do with chemical pollution. Lots and lots of chemical pollution. Now, again, if we reverse or return back to a vegan world, and when we do, we reduce pollution in two ways. Firstly, it is the trees themselves. Now, trees are so amazing that they, they soak up the water from underneath and they completely clean it, make it pure, and then transpire it out into the atmosphere. So they store all that chemical pollution and toxins within them. So now if you imagine when we're burning forests, we're actually releasing so much chemical pollution out into, into the atmosphere as well. So that's the first thing. And secondly, when we move away from animal products, we move away from um, poisoning and uh, toxin, you know, poisoning our own body with toxins because, as we know, at every trophic level, we are concentrating toxins because of bioaccumulation. So on two levels, we can reduce that as well. But the most important one is to do with wildlife itself and how not only the fact that they're keeping us alive, but they are affected by all of these planetary boundaries on top of the fact that they're being killed directly as a result of loss of habitat and as a result of them deemed competition for all the livestock that we're producing in the world. So again, this is a very well-known fact. 10,000 years ago, 99% of all land biomass was wild animals, 1% was humans, and today we have 67% livestock, 32% humans, and 1% wild animals. Literally pushed them to the brink of extinction. Now, Sila Shrao did an extrapolation of how fast the animals are dying, our cousins are dying. And from 10,000 years ago to 1960 to 1970, he found that we lost about 60 60 to 70 percent of all the wildlife that we started off with and then extrapolating that further he found that from 1970 to 2023 or 2010 sorry we lost 52 percent of what was left so if we extrapolate that further we're seeing that by 2026 now this is so shocking and i couldn't believe it as well but 
you know, that this science, this research, research has been checked by people in the most um, highest levels of research, environmental organizations as well. And it's looking like we're going to lose all wild animals by 2026. So we have a task for us. And again, this is another thing that I use to educate people that I meet. I show them how much of the land area of our earth we're using for animal agriculture. So you can see the red, all of that is used for the production of meat and dairy, and it only gives us 12% of the calories. We can see how much is desert, which we can't even use, but also built up land. Now, I work in Milton Keynes, and one of the things that a lot of people say to me is the fact that, oh, we're doing so much development, and that's affecting the wildlife, it's affecting the water, but I keep reminding them that's just 1% of the problem. 1% of all the land on our planet we have urbanized. Everything else is because of the food that we're eating. If you look at the plant-based foods, size of Australia, that's the amount of land that we're using for that, and we're getting 85% of our calories from there. When it comes to paper, when it comes to managed woodland, that's about 22%, and that's you can see the, the whole of North America, Central America, and the, and the top uh, area of South America. That's the amount of area that's used for that. And when it comes to original forests, which we need to save ourselves, this is all we have left. So less known facts that I learned over the last few years is the fact that methane is actually 120 times more powerful than CO2, not 23 times. And this 23 times number has been a result of creative accounting by the meat and dairy industries to basically um, downplay the effect of methane. Now, if we think about how it works, you know, it's most effective in the first few years and then the effect goes down. But it is in those first 20 years, 10 to 20 years, that methane does the most amount of damage. So the fact is, the world is heating up more from our methane emissions from animal agriculture than the, all the CO2 emissions from the entire transportation sector combined. All the fossil fuel combustion that happens, even more than transportation, transportation sector is dwarfed by the methane they were releasing as a result of animal agriculture. So we have to make sure that that message is absolutely clear if we want to stop the warming of our planet. The other thing is that the oceans don't forget. Now, what they did was they did an experiment whereby they tried to see how the oceans expand and contract as a result of a heating. And they found that even if we stopped all fossil fuel use by 2050, the oceans retain their expansion by 70% for the next 100, 200 years. So, you know, we have to remember that, you know, it's not just about stopping it today, or it's not stopping it by 2050, we have to stop this as soon as possible because the oceans are getting affected and that's affecting land. We've talked about the fact that the oceans provide more oxygen than forest and the soil combined, the absolute requirement of phytoplankton to survive, and we need to regrow at least one trillion trees. Now that seems like a lot, but it is something that we do need to do and it's something that is doable considering how much land we've committed to, to producing some of the most destructive industries on earth. So um, again, we know about this, I'm not gonna go through that, you know, the effect of fossil fuels as opposed to the effect of animal agriculture and deforestation. Another number that really, really surprised me was how much of an effect animal agriculture has in terms of percentage uh, of global greenhouse gas emissions that it contributes to. Now, when, again, Dr. Salish Rao did his research, he found out that it was as much as 87% if we took into consideration how much sequestration power we lose as a result of deforestation and how much we can actually gain if we actively reforested. But if we took into consideration those three things on the side here, which is the carbon sequestration potential of soil itself, which was underestimated before, the phytoplankton activity, which can only be, um, you know, which is being lost at the moment, but which can be sustained if we stop fishing, and the greenhouse gas emissions produced by the entire fishing industry, which is completely overlooked most of the time. And what he came up was a figure of 118%. Now, most of us will wonder, how is that even possible? But what 118% means, 
that we can literally go about our business doing everything that we're doing except for killing animals and the world and the earth will continue cooling itself. Now, this is amazing. We can carry on with our activities except for killing and eating animals and the earth will continue cooling itself, which is where we need to go. Okay, so we know about this. Three ways how animal agriculture affects the world, depletion of vital resources, pollution of land, air and water, and the deforestation and trawling of the oceans. This is a trifecta effect of this on every single level. To the solutions, now we know we have to go vegan to make this happen for so many reasons, but we also know that we have to reforest and rewild and rehabilitate the soil, which is so, so important. So on the first bit, we are taking away the damage. We're taking away the cigarettes of the lung cancer. And the second bit, which is the reforesting and protecting the oceans is we're healing ourselves. We can't do just one thing. We have to do all of it together, right? So we take away the effects, the, the damage, and we heal ourselves. And the soil is absolutely the foundation because if the, the soil is not healthy, we cannot have, be healthy. All of our nutrition, all of our nutrients come from healthy soil. I mean, you know, the other day, my mom brought some fruits and vegetables for us from a market in Kingsbury, North West London. And I know that a lot of that stuff comes from India, but I also know that it's just, it's, it's grown on farms that heavily use pesticides. The soil is depleted and the taste, when you taste these things, there's literally no taste. And if there's no taste, you know the nutrition is gonna be even less. So the soil is the foundation. And just like our bodies, the gut microbiome affects our immunity, literally our health. In the same way, microorganisms are important on every single level. The land, so the soil, the microorganisms and soil, the oceans, again, the microorganisms, which are the phytoplankton, and our body, which is the gut bacteria. So let's try and bring all of that together in trying to uh, talk to this about, about this with the people that we meet. We also know that it stores more carbon than all the vegetation in the world. And just by rehabilitating the soil and the world's 500 million hectares of abandoned agricultural land, we could sequester enough carbon to offset one third of annual green, global greenhouse gas emissions from fossil fuels while boosting food production. So this is the analogy that I use to try and stress to people the importance of soil, right? And I, I describe it as a house. So in the house, we have the brick and the mortar which is the, the sand, the clay, and the loam, and all of that, you know, the inorganic material. And then you have the people that are living in it, the microorganisms, the earthworms, the insects, the animals. And also the last bit is the nutrition, the organic material that we replenish the soil with. All of this has to work together. If you take any of those components away, the house crumbles. So the house has to be functioning well. And what's happening right now is that we're losing the structure of the soil because of burning of forests and deforestation, which leads to soil erosion. But we're also poisoning microorganisms with the use of pesticides, fungicides, herbicides, etc. And we are taking away the nutrition, nutrients, nutrients because of the use of artificial fertilizer that basically makes the soil overwork, as we already know, and the nutrients are lost. So this is something that was new to me, it's probably not new to you, but turbo boosting the rehabilitation of the soil again is so, so needed. And one of the things that I read in the books that I'm reading right now, which is Food is Climate, um, which is an excellent book, they talk about biochar. Now, for those of you who don't know what biochar is, it is the product that remains after um, biomass of, um, um, organic material is cooked in an oxygen deprived environment and you get this structure. So the, the, the process is called, is called pyrolysis and you get this amazing material which sequesters, which has already sequestered carbon. But what you need to do with biochar is what we can do is put it in the soil. And when we are able to put it in degraded soil, what it does, it acts as a soil amendment it improves the microorganism quality of the soil. It improves soil retention. It detoxifies the soil. It holds water. It does all sorts of amazing things. And what they've found is 
any time it's been used in degraded land, it makes it um, suitable for rewilding and um, growing vegetation again. So biochar is one of those materials. And now the other thing is more and more applications are being found. And the other amazing thing is that you can use organic material like uh, municipal waste, corn stalks, uh, wood chips, all sorts of stuff that's organic to create biochar. So that's the first thing. And secondly is aggressive pruning. Now, if you have um, you know, a newly grown forest, you can prune it aggressively. Remember that sequester the carbon, you take this prune material, convert it into biochar, put it into the soil, improve the soil, and then you can actually turbo boost the carbon sequestration power of newly renewed forests and also bring back the soil which might be degraded. So why one to, trillion tree, one to three trillion trees in order to reverse climate change? Now, if you try and do some maths, um, every year we produce 54 gigatons of carbon. We release it into the air net. Gigaton is a billion tons. So for us to go into drawdown, which is the state at which there's more carbon being sequestered as opposed to carbon being produced, what we need to do is put more carbon in. So if you imagine one tree, one mature tree sequesters about one ton of carbon. So over a period of 40 years, we can sequester about 25 billion tons a year, 25 gigatons with 1 trillion trees. Now that's halfway there to the 54 gigaton target. But what happens is whenever we're able to grow trees, the soil itself comes alive. And this is the power of soil. Soil stores about three times as much carbon. So again, when you rehabilitate, rehabilitate the soil, that could take us even above, way above the 54 gigaton target. But even better, hopefully a lot of these trees could be planted on previously farmed land, previous land that was dedicated to meat and dairy. So we have to do this. This is absolutely vital. But we know that nature is on our side. And if we keep doing this, nature itself will help us with this process. Now, some people say we need three trillion trees. Some people say we need one. I think anything about one to one trillion trees is going to help us tremendously in drawdown. So when I, when I looked into it and the kind of organizations that are working towards this, I came across Vegan Land Movement, which works in a way that they um, collect funds from the public and they buy previous uh, previously farmed land, so ex-dairy farms or um, you know, cattle farms, and they convert that and they rewild that area to the point where all the original ecosystem starts to come back, wildlife comes back. So it's an absolutely brilliant movement that I want you guys to check out. You have OneT.org, which is, again, another foundation that is dedicated to growing one trillion trees. There's BirdLife International that is dedicated to, again, leaving land back to nature, giving it back to nature so it can revive itself. Lots of organizations, but again, more people need to know about it and more people need to be involved in all of these things. Protecting the oceans, much harder than revitalizing the land. You know, we can tell people to watch Sea Spiracy, educate them that it is absolutely vital that we stop eating fishes today. Otherwise, there's no hope to protect the oceans. Um, there was previous campaigns that Animal Rising have done whereby they were able to pressurize the fisheries uh, with protests, uh, with campaigns. But again, I'm not sure what's happening at the moment, but we really do need to educate people about stopping eating fishes because you know the, the trawlers, the nets that go in, they catch everything. They catch the whales, the dolphins, the turtles, every single guardian that we have they get caught in the same net. So when it comes to solutions now, we know going vegan, reforesting, protecting the oceans. So how can we divide that? How can we make it practical and systemic and effective? So we can divide that into individual action, social action, and financial action. When it comes to individual action, I know most of us are doing this already. 
daily conversations with colleagues and clients. You know, I have a target every single day, even if it's not clients, people on the street, people that I meet, you know, anyone that I work with, I try and have a conversation with them related back to their family, their friends, the future. Make and give business cards or send links to useful websites and podcasts. Invite non-vegans to dinner, you know, show them how easy it is to do this because half of the battle is making it practical. You know, a lot of people want to do it, but they just can't seem to find the, the inspiration to do it. So this is why we're here. Plant trees in the neighborhood, you know, get your, na your neighborhood, your community involved. Work with local landowners and farmers. This is something that I do want to do. Talk to people, even if, you know, they're resistant. This is something that we need to try. And even if they could even dedicate some of their land to rewilding, growing trees. Again, they're educating themselves. And hopefully, who knows, they might even convert to other forms of farming. Um, grow food, which is, again, something that everyone that is listening to is, I'm sure, doing actively and you know, have a lot more knowledge on it, rehabilitating the soil and rescuing farmed animals if you can. Societal action, encouraging the local council to go plant-based. So this is something that I'm involved with, again, at the moment through plant-based councils. Um, for those of us who don't know about it, it's a national movement that's encouraging councils to go vegan. So for every national, uh, every meeting, main meeting that they have, or even you know other meetings that they have, the default should be the provision of plant-based foods. If they are to meet their targets, if they want to be in alignment with what they talk about, which is, you know, decarbonizing um, and saving the planet. You know, they can't just talk about it; they have to do it. And secondly, we can use that influence to to go into schools and hospitals. But it has to start with the councils because they have a lot of influence and power when it comes to education, when it comes to healthcare. Joining Animal Rising, you know, they do supermarket sit-ins. Again, they're very, very powerful in terms of educating the public. Um, volunteering at an animal sanctuary. So this is what something that we try and do um, as much as we possibly can. Rewilding with the vegan land movement, reforesting and volunteering your professional services. Now, as I mentioned before, it's not just about going vegan, reforesting and protecting the ocean. We have to do our best to improve the health care of the entire community of the world. Because if we are not healthy, if we have health issues, if we are not able to function, there's no way we can work together to save the environment, to save the soil, to save the trees, etc. So BLF stands for the Better Lives Foundation that I mentioned earlier. So, you know, we already know that there's quite a few meat and dairy farmers that have gone vegan. I'm sure there's a lot of people thinking about it uh, and that support we need to somehow give to them. Um, again, educating people on the on the right, right facts, because we know disinformation and misinformation is such a threat to our progress and survival. And doing everything to can we can to reforest, um, helping out of sanctuaries and incentivizing the adoption of um, uh, animals that have been uh, tormented and tortured by the animal industries. So you can see that, you know, the sharks, whales, dolphins, all of them get caught in industrial fishing. So we need to end that immediately. But this is coming now to the final point, which is the money game. Now, certainly, if we can do everything we can in terms of action, in terms of protests, everything that we're doing, but if we cannot change the money game, all of our efforts are going to waste. And I'm going to explain that to you in the next five minutes. Now, if you think about what money is and why we why we earn and do what we do, it's the exchange of life energy for currency to live in the present and secure our future. That's what it comes down to. But 99% of us are living far beyond our needs as a result of, you know, supposed fear for the future because we, you know, we have this um, anxiety about not having enough. But that leads to the obsession with economic growth at the expense of planetary destruction. Now, entire governments are um, unelected as a result of not fulfilling the promise of economic growth. This is how obsessed we are as a world. And I can understand why. We can all understand why, because we it's how, it's how the system is made. 
but every single percentage of economic growth comes as a result of planetary destruction. So we really need to address this. So fundamentally, why do we need to grow our money, as they say? To beat inflation, we know this, to secure our health against chronic diseases in the future, and to create generational wealth. This is basically the three main reasons why we all strive to grow our money. Now, fundamentally, I'm not a, I'm not a financial expert or anything from my understanding. What I know is that inflation results from the government printing more money to pay off perpetual debt. As a result of more money coming into the economy, the value of money goes down, which means that prices of everything goes up. But it's not just a supply and demand issue with money. The fact that we are reducing vital resources on the planet is making everything expensive. We're overusing food for the wrong reasons, wasting water, wasting land, shelter. So when you waste land, you know, land prices go up, everything goes up. So again, I know I'm sure you, I, I, you know I'm alluding to why it's so important to go to a vegan world as soon as possible. So the government is in a perpetual debt because of healthcare costs. You know, trying, for example, in this country, the NHS needs, it's just, a, it's a never ending well. Uh, promised pensions, you know, all the pensions that were promised to the people who are retiring now, you know, they have to pay them. And where do they create that money from? By printing more money, by taxing us more. Farm subsidies, most of the farm subsidies goes towards animal farming, warfare, Again, we know billions of pounds and dollars go into the manufacture of weapons that are fueling so many wars at the moment. Pandemics, we know how expensive the pandemic was for us. In the US alone, it costed them nearly 16 to 20 trillion dollars. So imagine what the world has had to um, endure because of it. And the need to buy de depleting resources. So again, um, you know, when it when it comes to buying what is depleted, the prices go up. And investing in unsustainable and unethical businesses, for example, animal farming, uh, that leads to additional costs of global warming, food shortages, flooding, and refugees. Now you see, this is a never-ending cycle. It's a vicious cycle that only leads to more debt, more economic growth, more destruction of the planet. Now, if you see on the right, these are some of the biggest companies in the world. And guess what's fueling them? The World Bank, you know, the, the, the bank that the developmental banks that are basically have funds inside of them that come from governments. And guess where governments get their funds from? From us. So we are indirectly fueling some of the most destructive industries on the planet as a result of the taxes and a result of our pensions and as a result of our investments. So we have to really, really rethink where our money is going. So just a summary of some of the costs, deforestation is costing us two to five trillion pounds every single year. The production and consumption of animal products costs 30 trillion in health and environmental damages and antibiotic resistance, which is another big problem that we're gonna face, 10 million people um killing off killing them off by by 2050 and costing the world economy 100 trillion dollars do we have money like that no we don't and guess what it's going to come at the cost of the destruction of the planet so they claim that funding from us through taxes bonds and by printing money a very simplistic view but that's what's happening now fundamentally most businesses corporations and banks invest our money in further destruction and all of our social good is negated by where our money is flowing. So how do we counteract this? Now, fundamentally, we're, we have to look at where our costs are going. 90% of healthcare costs are coming from activities that we are responsible for. So if you imagine, if you remember the previous slides, we're looking at trillions of dollars that go into healthcare. The only way they can recover that cost is by, again, destroying the planet. But guess what? The population, us, we are responsible for these costs. So let's have a look. Out of the eight risky behaviors that are causing so much of our healthcare costs, poor diet is number one and constitutes most of that damage. And that leads to all those diseases and all those illnesses and chronic conditions that most of us suffer from. 
the NHS pays for this. We all pay for this. So if you go back and if we can sort out our diet, everything improves. Even those that don't care about animals, every even their economies, their lifestyle, their future, everything improves. So this is something that we really need to focus on. The other ones are physical inactivity, smoking, lack of health screening, insufficient sleep. So healthcare, again, very, very important sorting that out if we are to change the money game. Now, if you think about what sustains this, the costs of it, we have built a system where we need to be sick and ill for the money game to continue. So not only is our, our disease and our lack of awareness sustaining it, we have this future fear of needing to have massive pensions and savings because most of us are under the impression, yeah, we're going to be affected by cancer, diabetes, obesity. So why don't we work on preventing it? Prevention is always cheaper and easier than the cure. And we know, all of us know, that the best way to prevent all of these diseases is to shift to a whole foods, plant-based nutrition. This is another angle we can come with when we're talking to other people. So we've we've talked about that. So Les Rao, again, I have to be thankful for this, for this information. And we call it the oxygen mask rule because when we're able to heal ourselves, when we're able to get better, we can help the entire world. So let's help ourselves first. So trying to close this, fundamentally, where does our money go? It goes into purchasing, it goes into saving, investing, and taxes. So what we have to do is be conscious about how those four things affect the solutions of going vegan by 2026, reforesting and rewilding, healing the oceans. How does this impact these three things and how can we make it better to make sure that we boost the things on the right? So the first thing that we found out was the bank that we were with, Santander, was an absolute destruction uh, machine. It was funding a lot of the Amazon destruction. It was funding the, the all the unethical activities that we can think about. So if you think about Lloyd's, Barclays, all of the big banks that we can think about. Most of the money that we put into these banks gets reinvested in other companies. So like weapons, deforestation, animal farming, mining, everything that we are against, even human rights abuses, our money is becoming blood money when it's being invested in all of these things. So we have to be careful about where we put our money. So Ethical Consumer Magazine did a massive survey and research on these things and they found out that banks like nationwide co-op are some of the very good banks tried us but i found that nationwide came top because yes they do invest in things but it's the least destructive which is real estate so that's where we've shifted our money we live in a broken system so we have to make sure that we create the least amount of damage now the website that's really really helpful as well as switch it.green do check it out it helps to not only give you better options for transferring your money but it automatically generates a letter that you can send to your bank and say look this is why i'm leaving you when banks hear about this you know we might think it's just one letter one client trust me they get hurt and they get affected because if they lose one client they're going to lose more clients Secondly, they reinvest 90% of our savings and they, they give out so much more. So they literally um, amplify our savings to fund all of these industries. So they're losing out a lot more just by us shifting our bank accounts to other banks. So that's vitally important. Secondly, our pensions. Now, there's three trillion pounds in the UK alone that are in pension funds. Unfortunately, most pension funds are invested in and contributing to everything that is taking away our future. You know, you think what a pension is. A pension is something that's meant to secure your future. What is it doing? It's literally destroying our future. Again, animal farming, weapons, deforestation, ocean destruction. If we really look at what these guys are investing our pensions in or what the pension companies are investing our funds in, everything that we disagree with. So again, I had to look into all of these things and I found out 
that one of the more ethical vehicles for pensions is NIST. Now, for those of you who don't know, NIST is a pension fund that the Labour Party started a few years back. They have funds for self-employed people. They have funds for you know, companies where their employees can, employees' pensions can be shifted into. But out of all the companies that they invest their funds in, there's one red flag that I'm kind of working on and making people aware of is AstraZeneca. All the other companies seem green. AstraZeneca is the red flag. So one thing that we can do is shift our money to Nest and then write to Nest and say, look, this is what we disagree with. And please do everything you can to take your funds out or do something along those lines, because we are aware of this. And this is a real bugbear when it comes to ethical pensions. You can't call yourself ethical if you still have funds in pharmaceuticals like AstraZeneca, which does testing, still tests on animals. This is the problem. Billions of animals are being tested on in, in the labs. And, and this is what I found out with the podcast that I did with Dr. Andre Minash. And we are against all of that. So we have to address this and we have to keep pressurizing the CEOs and governments to end animal testing overall. And that will help the effect of AstraZeneca as well. The other thing that we have done now, this is something that I'm sharing with you guys that we have personally done, is invested in plant-based food companies like Omni, which is the plant-based uh, dog food company, uh, Ripple, which makes um, plant-based milks, La Vie and this make plant-based uh, meat alternatives. This is the future. Other countries are already jumping on it. Other people are already jumping on it. You know, there's a lot of bad mouthing when it comes to alternative meats, but this is the way it's going because it's so much more expensive and damaging to produce meat and dairy. We've also invested in a company called CV Generation, which is uh, focused on marine permaculture. We need to regrow those forests in the ocean which are so vital for not only cooling the planet, for oxygenating the, plant, uh, the, the oceans, and also reducing hurricane risk, but also for us to sequester the carbon that's been released into the atmosphere. We've um, invested in reforestation companies, for example, Reforest, which is a company that uses drones to reforest. Now, this is quite a new company that hopefully will get much more attention and investment if you are to reforest very, very quickly. Um, we give our money to vegan sanctuaries as well. Now, I call it investment because it is an investment. It's an investment in our future. These sanctuaries help to educate others. And through that, we are creating a vegan world. And that's what we're investing in. In effective movements like vegan land movement, healthcare charities like Bed Lives Foundation, and plant-based food charities, which do so much to give free food to the hungry. So that's what these companies look like. I've actually written blogs on banking and pensions on my website. It's called kevalashah.com. Please have a look at it. When it comes to pensions, please do give me a few days to amend it. I haven't amended it when it comes to what I found out about Nest. So please do bear with me when it comes to that. And finally, when it comes to taxes, now this is really difficult, but we have to keep pressurizing influencing councils and councillors to divest away from animal agriculture and invest in rewilding and, re and reforestation. You will be shocked how much of our money goes into destructive industries, even through governments. Secondly, influence DEFRA to stop subsidizing animal farming. Animal Rising are doing an amazing job when it comes to that, pressurizing, pressurizing and also pressurizing councils to stop investing their pensions in, in intensive farming. Now, check this out. This was 2022, and it was found out that UK councils are investing millions in factory farming through their pension funds. So um, one of the organizations I'm not aware of, I not, can't remember right now, but they did a massive campaign. It's still going on, generating automatic letters to send to councils and say, look, we know what you're doing. This needs to stop because of all these reasons. 238 million pounds poured into industrial livestock companies. Whose money was that? It's our money, money that we work so hard for, and that's being converted to blood money. Development banks, again, this is what governments do. 2.6 billion have been pumped. So, you know, these are all the things that we need to be working on. 
these are all the success stories. The New, New York has, has had a lot of success because their own mayor healed himself from diabetes and has made sure that as a default, eight of their hospitals are serving plant-based meals as a default. If the patients want meat, that's fine, but this is served as a default. And this is the example that we need to follow. Now, when it comes to the UK, we're almost like we like to copy what the US is doing. So we need to tell them, look, these guys are already doing it. Do you want to be left behind? Give them the examples. Other cities in in our country, you know, have already are already thinking about it. So this is how we can encourage our own councils to to endorse and go on and become plant based councils. Universities are changing again, massive, massive change because they are the ones that you know disseminate the education and the research. Entire countries are shifting their food policies. Now, again, we need to remind England about this, UK about this, the other countries are already ahead, not just for ethical reasons, not just for the climate, but also for the profits that we can have as a result of shifting to plant-based protein. Okay, so we're coming near the end now. Sustainable goals. Number 18 is what Silas Shriver has proposed to change. Now, 18 was economic growth. He's changed that to zero animal exploitation because as we have come to know, when we work on this, we don't have to be as obsessed with economic growth because when we better our health, when we better our lifestyles, when we get rid of poverty as a result of having more resources for the entire planet because of shifting to a vegan world, we can help every single sustainable goal out there. Now, this is the trick that these guys are absolutely missing out on. And this is what we need to pressurize them to do. But also starting small, starting from our own communities and going outwards. So we have only one home. We have to do everything to, to try and save it. 2026 is the target. I know it feels like almost impossible. But if we are to save the wildlife that are keeping us alive, the guardians of our planet, we have to do this. And I believe in the power of exponential change. Just like the internet came about so quickly and so fast, we can make this happen. But it means we have to work every single day to make this happen, not just with education, but empowering others to rehabilitate the soil, grow more trees, and then grow food, all the fun things that we can do together that's what we need to focus on and finally change where our money is going because all of the other things get negated if we don't shift and change the money game so thank you so much uh, everyone for listening i know it's been a very long one uh, but i hope uh, that you may manage to stay till the end uh, if we have time you know I'm, I'm happy to answer as many questions as i can but again, lastly, if there's anything that might have been wrong or inaccurate, please do forgive me and hopefully we can work together to make this happen. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Kaval. That was a, a very fascinating talk with lots of information. And I've been following the YouTube comments whilst uh, we have been um, we've been going. So I just want to um, thank you, everyone, actually, out there in YouTube for commenting. Um, just want to start with Ashvin. Ashvin says, people know, but don't act. Oh, there we go. Thank you, Maestro. That's exactly what I was going to say then. People know, but don't act. Why? So I feel, again, it's going back to those four reasons that either they're not aware. Secondly, if they are aware, they don't care about it because they see it as a future problem for their, for their kids or grandkids. Um, and if they are um, aware, of, again, they don't care. We already, sorry, we already mentioned that, but also they feel disempowered. So what is one person going to do? How is that going to affect anything? And lastly, for those who are doing their bit, they feel that there's not enough support for them financially and morally. So yeah. that's what we need to work on. Beautiful. Hearts there from uh, Navia. Um Oh, here we go. They're coming up. I just wanted to uh, just one thing I would add to your presentation, uh, Dr. Caval, is to encourage people to join the Vegan Organic Network. 
because uh, in my work over the many, many years of um, environmental campaigning, it's the, the most effective and most aligned charity that I have found. So I think joining the Vegan Organic Network is just solutions are there. We you know, go veganic, save the planet. Okay, Michelle St. John, brilliant. So informative and will certainly take action on my pension and investments. Thank you so much. Very important information that you shared there as well. Maestro, I'm just going to pull one up here. Um, this is from Navia. What is the best action an everyday person can take? Okay, so as individuals, going vegan straight away, which we already are, but also encouraging as many people as we can to do it. So connecting conversations every single day, having business cards ready to give to them, but also connecting it to their own level. So ask them first, what's important to you? What are your kids doing? How many years do you think we have left? And, you know, they, they'll, they'll just think, oh, it's, everything's okay. But you have to remind them, these are our timelines. We need to shift by 2026 because our guardians are dying. So these are the kind of conversations we need to have. So not in a way that we actually point fingers, but working together. You know, what are we doing about it? Thirdly, encouraging people to come over or, you know, taking food to where you're working, plant-based foods, you know, handing out leaflets and things so they can practically make that shift. You know, you know, we were told that we're the product of the five or six people around us every day. Yeah. Become that person that constantly encourages optimistically, you know, being there for others and just say to them, look, if there's anything that you need, you know, give us a call at any time. We'll be there, you know, to help you out with the cooking or whatever. So that's, uh, some of the individual action, again, you know, change where you're banking, change your investment, change where your money is going. And finally, you know, grow your food, grow your own food if you can, save animals if you can. You know, if you need any, if anyone needs any any advice when it comes to looking after chickens, uh, you know, we're more than happy to help you, you know, getting the right runs and the, the coops and all of that, because all of that is important. But that will, again, open so many doors because we've had people that come over and they finally see them as not nuggets. They see them like they see puppies and kittens and animals. And they just think, okay, I can't do this. I can't go back and go to McDonald's anymore. So if you think about it, individual, societal, and financial action, just break it down. Have targets in your book or in your journal every day and just tick it off. This is what I got done. Because we have to put it on the same level as making money. You know, we're all so disciplined and so committed to making money. We have these auditing accounts, all of this stuff down to the penny. But what we need to do is shift that same focus and mindset towards saving our world. Because you could be the richest guy on the planet, but what's the point if there's no planet to live on? Well, I suppose that's why some people are trying to get to Mars, isn't it? Um, but no, 100%. We had a few things flash up there. The first one I wanted just to make everyone aware of, the listeners out there, is the Vegan Organic Network map. Now, if you have a plot of land, it might even be a window box. It might be a, a big farm. It might be a garden. But you are actually growing food veganically, which means without any stock animal inputs, you can go on the Vegan Organic Network map. Now, our beautiful garden here in sunny Suffolk is on the map. And we're looking forward to, oh, here we go. We're looking forward to putting on an event soon, welcoming people to show how we are gardening and growing our healthy food, but how you can as well. And so if you've got if you're not on the map, but you grow any food veganically, then you can go to veganorganic.net and sign up on the map. But also, if you'd like to put on any events, we want to connect people with the solutions. And, you know, as you, you pointed out many of the, the time there, we really need to be focused on solutions. Uh, we just had a question that flashed up there, um, which was a lady who was 60. Sorry, I forgot her name. There we go, Maestro. It's Sue. Sue Gee, if you're still listening, Sue, God bless you. She's 66, and 99% of the people I mix with sadly do nothing about the climate. They do nothing about it. They just, they just think it's all just going to sort itself out. Maybe it's just not their problem. You struggle to engage with them and get them to take it seriously. Now, my advice would be, Ask them about their lives. As you said there, uh, right, I think if we start off by lecturing other people, they can often shut off. But if you can actually engage with them, as, as Caval just said, 
about their own needs, about their own interests, about their own concerns, and then link it into these solutions. I mean, anything to, to add to Sue there, Caval? No, that's that's pretty much it. Even even the war in Gaza right now, you know, we can link it back to what is happening. You know, how are they funding this war? You know, you're getting all this funding from other countries. We're playing a part in that as well. Our government's playing a part in it. And and the other thing is the climate, you know, the, the, the global warming, the climate change that's happening as a result of all this bombing and you manufacture weapons, all of this has a you know, all of this has um, as an effect. So what we can say, look, if we were to counteract all this damage that's being done, this is another way we can do it. We can take charge of our own finances because there are other industries that are destroying it even more. So let's try and work on those. You know, the antidote to helplessness is action. So let's try take action in different ways. We can't be there helping people in Gaza, but we can do other things here that helps millions of species uh, the antidote is action almost could have been a quote from the great mahatma gandhi uh, and one of the guests that we've had on the uh, the show before is dr will tuttle who wrote the book the world peace diet and it's certainly something that i've kind of had in my consciousness for for many years is the idea that what we're actually eating is affecting us not just on a physical level a mental emotional level also on a spiritual level and the, the Hare Krishna movement believe that global war is created by the consumption of animals killed in these atrocious conditions, that the very vibrational energy is then affecting them mm. to do these crazy things. So I think that we do have the solutions. For me personally, I believe it is a veganic solution. It's a vegan organic solution. You mentioned in your talk there, um, Kaval, very rightly, that we want to be moving towards a whole food plant-based diet uh, and i would say actually an organic whole food plant-based diet as local as we can and uh, oh here we go i've always enjoyed the bill mollison idea the organic is the next step it is i mean permaculture is a wonderful system that we can apply to everything and as again as gandhi said there is nothing as powerful as an idea that's time has come and i really do believe that you know, as we've got a, a, a growth in this vegan movement. But quite frankly, I don't want to be eating processed food, vegan food. No, thank you. I want to be eating healthy, whole food. Kaval, you look like a healthy man. And I'm certainly feeling healthy and strong. And I think this is another thing I'd, I'd pass a message on to the vegans out there. If we're going to convert anyone, if we're going to change anyone to move to a plant-based diet, we have to be healthy ourselves. I've seen so many sick vegans in my life that, you know, you know, just make sure you're getting your nutrients, vegans, get out in the sun and get strong and, what you know, be healthy, because I think that's how we're going to convince people. And so, Caval, any final words from you, my friend? Thank you. On behalf of Vegan Organic Network, your excellent presentation. Um, final words. Well, if if you can. Do uh, go on to my website, and if you in it, the other thing is go to YouTube and type in Glass Walls Podcast. And Dr. Silesh Rao's uh, podcast that I did, the last one that I did, which is the engineer that gives a simple solution to the climate crisis. Please do watch it because, out of in every person that I talk to, he's the one that's given me the most hope and the most conviction. And the way he explains it, it's so simple and it's so heartfelt that I feel that even people who are not vegan will be really touched by it. So please do share that if you can. Um, and, that, and that's pretty much it. And the other thing is, this is the this is the other Bible that I'm, I carry around with me. It's called Food is Climate. Okay. So, yeah. Wonderful. Those are the two things. Well, thank you so much. Uh, oh, what's the name of the podcast again, please? It's called the Glass Walls Podcast. So if you think about, you know, exposing injustices, what's behind those walls? So you make it glass, oh. Glass Walls Podcast. Well, it's, it's so true, isn't it? And they say that if slaughterhouses had windows, the world would be the world would be vegan. So let's have those glass walls. Well, on behalf of the maestro behind the scenes, Dan Graham, and all of the team at the Vegan Organic Network, we'd like to thank Dr. Caval very much for his excellent presentation. And of course, 
Oh, yes, we watched the interview. He's incredible. Thank you for all your comments and feedback out there as well in the world of social media. Of course, this video will be up, so share it to your friends and uh, share that Glass Walls podcast as well. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Good morning. Good afternoon. God bless you all.